Okay, so in yesterday's class, we were uh, discussing some of the second order effects. A uh, couple of lectures back, we discussed one of the important second order effects, which was channel end modulation and its effect on output resistance. And uh, its effect is kind of profound because we essentially uh, neglected the channel end modulation and we assumed y2 to be zero or r not to be infinity. But as it turns out, that is uh, that is a very wishful thinking because your MOSFET is not an ideal current source. And then we saw uh, what effect that, uh, it has. It turns out that it might end up limiting the maximum gain that you can get out of a common source amplifier kind of configuration, right? So this becomes, and then we saw uh, a, a possible scenario of improving the gain of a common source amplifier in the presence of uh, in the presence of channel and modulation, or rather, while considering channel and modulation. And there were two things we considered. One was One was the fact that one was the fact that if we increase the length, if we increase the length, the, the GDS decreases or this effective RDS increases. Not mind you, this is a parasitic capacity, parasitic resistance. It's not an actual resistance. So when you are considering the the DC DC Poisson conditions, don't consider the presence of RDS because this is only in the incremental sense. Uh, so what we noticed was uh, the value of RDS is to some extent in a designer's control. And how can I do that for the same current if we increase L? The value of RDS increases and is proportional. However, if we simply increase L, it becomes problematic because the current will change because current is proportional to W over L. So we uh, we said that hey, why don't we increase W? Why don't we increase L by the same proportion? So nothing changes as far as the current of the GM is concerned. However, RDS has increased, and which means that it's getting closer and closer to a ideal common source amplifier with very high output impedance. But then we said that okay, this is probably not a feasible scenario because beyond certain uh, certain extent, you probably will not be able to increase the size of the transistor because of economic reasons. So then we said that what else can be done? Uh, we thought that we will uh, we thought about the problem and we figured that the main issue is whatever incremental current that is flowing out, that is GM times VI, was getting diverted between RDS and this RL. And then we said that if can we put something here, can we put something there so that such that its input impedance is close to zero or much lesser than RDS. So R in should be much lesser than RDS. If this is the case, then all the incremental current will flow into that flow into that network and not into RDS. Which means that then once the current flows into a network, I can do something about it. I can extract it from the other end and pass it through RL. Right. So this is RL. So in other words, what we were looking for, we are looking for a network whose input impedance is very close to zero or much, much less than RDS. Or in other words, we are looking for a current buffer or a current control source. And uh, and we, we, we had discussed current buffers in another context a few lectures back. And that happened to be a common gate amplifier, right? A common gate configuration. And that was this. So if we do the uh, yeah, if we do the math as it turns out, this input impedance which we calculated yesterday was equal to RL plus RDS two by one plus GM RDS two, and this was a common gate configuration, right? And we also call it CAS code. So. Uh, so common gate means incrementally the gate is shorter, right? So the easy way to think about it is whatever is common, you can think of grounded, like grounded gate configuration. So, uh, uh, so then we saw that this, this can, I mean, if you can, uh, now it looks like this RN is not exactly equal to RN, right? And if I, if I can make my uh, GMRDS2 to be much, much greater than one, which or even greater than one, uh, which uh, which is a fair enough 
assumption to make uh, in, in case of a transistor. Then, uh, and also if we can make RDS2 slightly greater than R2, then I can say that this can converge to one over GM2. Right? So now, uh, depending upon the values of GMs, I can say that this is looking in impedance is one over GM2, and this impedance is RDS. So essentially, the current GM times VI current that is flowing out of the transistor would prefer to go into one over GM2 and not into RDS because one over GM is a lower resistance than, than RDS. So with, if the current prefers to go into uh, this common gate or this magenta uh, transistor, transistor M2, which means most of this current will flow out of GM time, out of M2 and go into R2 and we'll get whatever we want. Now, this is obviously an approximation. It will always be a fraction of GM times VI, but the goal is to make the fraction as close to one as possible. And depending upon the values of the components that you can choose, you can go as close to, I mean, uh, uh, as close to uh, uh, one as, uh, as you want to be, depending upon the values of GM2 and RDS2, right? So this was uh, something that we discussed yesterday. And then uh, we extended this discussion and said that there is an important distinction that needs to be made between M1 and M2. Uh, and the distinction was the fact that uh, the source of M1 is grounded, but the source of M2 is not grounded. Now, no, we noted that uh, a transistor essentially is a fourth terminal device with the body being the fourth terminal. We have, since we have for all, uh, till, uh, the, till now in all our discussions, we have assumed that the body and the source are grounded together, are sorted together. But uh, in a, in a, uh, uh, when you are making a transistor, you are making a transistor on a p-type substrate, but the p-type substrate is common to everybody, which means the body is common to everybody. A, two transistors cannot have a different body, but two transistors can have a different source. So essentially, what does this translate to? This translates to the fact that this fourth terminal of M1 is grounded, fourth terminal of M2 is also grounded, the body terminal. However, the, however, the source of M2 is not grounded. And what and we saw that there is a side effect to this. And the side effect to this was that of body effect. That is, if there is a if there is a, a, a finite voltage VSP between uh, the source and the body, then the threshold voltage of the transistor increases. Or in other words, the threshold, I mean, and if the if that VSP also changes. Right. If the signal swings, if the source voltage changes, then the VSB is changing. If VSB changes, the threshold voltage is also changing. If threshold voltage changes with signal swing, which means the current is changing with signal swing, which means there is an incremental relation between the current and, and VSB, which means that there should be a transconductance associated with this effect. And the transconductance we, uh, we modeled as So this is our core GM. This is the RDS and the extra transconductance that is that is associated with our transistor. We can call it as GMB times PBS. Okay, so this becomes my new model of the transistor. So note that we started off with only this. Right, because GM is the centerpiece. That's what we want. But everything that comes alongside it is something you have to live with. Right? It's one of those things which you cannot wish away. They they exist, but what we have to ensure by design is that uh, they are not dominant. Okay. And as it turns out, uh, in case of GMB, it's uh, it's not such a bad thing. After all, you see why it's not such a bad thing in certain cases. Uh, but uh, even then. Even then, if you consider this value of GMB is typically in the range of 0.1 to 0.2 times GM. So this is the this is this is typically the range of GMB. So I mean, if somebody neglect and somebody uh, let me write it in a more formal way, 0.1 times GM, 0.2 times GM. Now, these numbers are obviously not sacrosanct. Uh, they will they can change depending upon technology. But this is typical values that you get uh, that you get to see. Now, the effect of this is essentially the fact that even in your design, if you sometimes forget or neglect GMB, you won't miss by much. 
right? There will be some error, but that error you can iterate and uh, and check, right? So one of the reasons we hand wave and 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 say that we will neglect the rigorous maths in design is because we know that we have to ultimately at the end of the day iterate because as it turns out a transistor model is fairly complicated. It's not with, uh, it's not as simple as mu n c ox w bar two l d g s minus b t whole square one plus lambda v d s, right? So that is a very simplistic model. If you to, if you take device modeling courses or compact modeling compact modeling courses later on in your electives. You will see that this a in order to accurately model a transistor, which a simulator does, you will probably require more than 100 parameters. And obviously, you cannot design a circuit with having 100 variables in your mind. So you'll have to pick and choose which are which one of those are the most relevant and the most important. And that's what the circuit designers tend to do. We tend to see that okay, this is important, we'll concentrate on that. That is not important, we'll concentrate on maybe not concentrate or concentrate on it later. So that's why we have proceeded in this course. We have assumed that the centerpiece of our design is GM. We have built circuits assuming that is the only thing that is that matters. And then later on, uh, since a couple of classes back, we have started to incorporate the non-idealities, right? So which we have to deal with, but we should not forget that just because all of them are on the screen doesn't mean, mean that all of them are, are of equal importance. The fundamental thing a transistor is, is a GM. Everything else are bells and whistles around it, right? So you have to live with that, but you should be aware of the fact that what are the effects of those? Okay, so, so that's essentially uh, the core of the design. So now, uh, if, we, uh, if we try to see the effect of this GMB in, our, uh, uh, in, in this configuration, what will it be? So, So this is our M1 transistor. So this is GM1. And I have an M2 transistor on top. And I will replace the same thing, same model for the input transistor. <laughs> so this is it's a BS. So <laughs> this current. The GM current becomes GM times minus Vs. Uh, okay, so now one one by one. So what do you think will VBS be for M1? Incremental VBS. VBS will be zero, right? Because the source is hard ground, body is hard ground. Uh, they are not even changing. I mean, they don't not even change. Uh, they don't even have a DC value across it. So this is zero. So this goes off, right? So what do you think will uh, will the GMB contribution for M two be? How will I write it? It will be GMB two times VBS of two. So what is VBS of two of M two? This is yes. So VBS means VB minus VS. What is VB? Pardon? VB is zero and so zero minus VS. Right? So, so you see that in this particular case, this GM and GMB2 seem to have the same effect, right? So one is GM times VS flowing up, other is GMB2 and VS flowing up. So I can essentially club them, club those two together. Okay. So if I club those two together, what will be the input impedance looking in? How will the input impedance change? So initially the input impedance was this. Or the impedance looking into the uh, to the source was that. So how will I modify that input impedance? Yeah. 
yeah gm2 will be simply gm2 plus gmb2 right because they are coming in parallel and having the same effect so your rn is rl plus rts2 by 1 plus <coughs> This is a good thing or a bad thing for this particular configuration. It's a good thing, right? I am I am able to decrease the R in further, right? So body effect need not necessarily be a bad thing all the time, right? So in the assignment, I'll give one or two configurations where you'll see that it's uh, it can go either way, right? For example, in this considered configuration, it looks like it's a good thing, but there might be some other configuration where it might not be such a good thing. Okay. Okay, fine. So now uh, let's. Uh, yes. We want to reduce the effective RN. Yes. We are able to essentially effect, increase the effective GM now because GMB is coming in parallel to GM. Right? Okay. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, let me take you back uh, to one of the old configurations that we were discussing, and we will discuss the same old configuration. We'll discuss the current mirror. We'll discuss current mirror configurations, taking into account the effect of channel length modulation. Okay. So, so why is that important? That is important because ultimately we want to bias everything with a constant current source, right? So let's assume that you have a network, and you want to bias it with a constant current source. And then we saw that you cannot stick in a current source all the time for every network that you want to bias, which means that I'll have to somehow use one constant current source and generate the equivalent current uh, for all other transistors, right? So, and then we came up with this configuration of diode connected transistor, which generates the requisite voltage to pass this constant current. M1 is the M2. And then we said that <laughs> if VGS, these two transistors have the same VGS, which means if I not flows through the uh, through M1, I not will flow through M2 also, assuming both the W by Ls are identical. Okay. So that is one is to one mirroring ratio. So if if if, if that is the case, then this is I0. But now we know better. So what do we know? We know that the transistor, uh, granted that the transistor uh, M2 has to be in saturation, but having transistor only in saturation does not necessarily guarantee that I0 will be identical. Do you agree with that statement? Yes or no? The statement I'm making is just because M1 and M2 both are in saturation and they have the same VGS doesn't necessarily mean the currents through both of them will be exactly identical. Yes. So you'll have, because ultimately my IDS is mu n C or C of W over 2L, you have V over drive squared times one plus lambda VDS, right? So there is a dependence on VDS. There is a weak dependence. It's not a very strong dependence, but there is a dependence nonetheless. So since there is a dependence on VDS, if you have to ensure that both the transistors have identical current, what do you need to ensure? We cannot short, right? If we short, then, okay. So, okay, even before shorting, what do you need to ensure? You have to ensure that the drain to source voltages are also identical, right? But his proposal is why don't you short this? Right? Is this what you meant? Okay, so if you short this, what is going to happen? Yes, Vs will be same, that I agree. But, ah, right? So the current that is coming from top can also go this side, right? So you, you wouldn't want that. So you cannot short that. So you have to find some other ways of ensuring that the, Drain to source voltage are identical. That is number one, right? So number one problem, number number one goal is ensure 
radius of m1 and m2 are same okay uh, there is a number two problem the number two problem is if you have i mean when you are having this network which which you are trying to bias with a constant current source obviously that there is some input and output to the network right so there are probably inputs here v1 v2 or v in one v in two you can have as many inputs as you think which essentially means that it's not guaranteed that this node voltage will stay constant this node voltage can swing right any arbitrary network there is no guarantee that the voltage at, at across m2 will remain constant it can swing so now if it swings what's going to happen can you comment on the uh, on the current i not right exactly right so now uh, since id as you rightly pointed out ids is really de dependent on vds if vds is changing then the current to the transistor will also change right and can we do a smart small signal approximation of how much is going to change let's say this voltage swing is delta v delta vds let's say can we do a approximation and figure out how much will be a change in i not b now that we know small signal analysis pardon yes that's correct uh, but in terms of small signal parameters can you tell me gm gds those things so i have rds which is one of our gds if i if there is a delta vds swing how much current will flow into that incremental uh, resistance is the question clear he rightly pointed out that i can simply say i can replace this <laughs> this vds with delta vds and i will get mu and c of w over 2l uh, v over d square times lambda vds right that will be the delta but what does that uh, sweep i mean the reason i am interested in going into the small signal parameters is because it's easier to foresee what's going to happen because moment you have multiple transistors you won't be able to write these equations it will become third order and fourth order and all so that becomes messy to handle so it's better to quickly move to small signal model and see in using small signal model if i can approximate the changes so if i have delta vds change across m2 how much change in current will i have across m2 through m2 rather So if i have delta vds change across m2 what is going to happen you can think of this m2 to be ideal gm with rds in parallel pardon exactly right so this current will be delta vds times gds right you have delta vds across rds the current is ohm's law delta vds by rds right delta vds times gds okay so as you can see that this can also become a bit of a problem because you are if you have an ideal current source you change the voltage across it as much as you want the current doesn't change but in this case it's a non ideal current source <coughs> which means the the current changes if the signal swings right so the second problem is i not can vary with change in vds okay so these are the two problem problematic scenarios so let's target the second scenario first yes ah okay his question is if i short it why will a current flow right okay so when you have so now the current that is coming from top it has two ways to go right it can go this side it can go that side 
right? So now, how can we ensure that the stuff you have I naught through MD? Right, because if this this current through M two is is kind of a summation of current that is coming from the left and the coming from current that is coming from the top. You cannot ensure that. Pardon? Correct. Okay, so need not necessarily be any network will have a unique solution. Correct. So I can have two completely different networks having same currents. Right. So that's quite possible. So it's not necessary to come to, I mean, so in, 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 in design, you will see that even forget about solutions. If I tell you, if I give you a certain design to do, there can be multiple ways of coming up with that same specifications. Okay, depending on what is your starting point, right? So it will not be unique. Yes. Uh, sir, we are seeing the uh, current to I, so that is another problem. That is another problem. I'll get to that. But you cannot guarantee that current through M2 will also remain the same, right? How can you guarantee that? But the problem that he is raising is a even more, even a bigger problem. Is because now if you what is the current source? The current source is looking in this R out to 10 to infinity. Correct. But if you short these two, what will that R out be? So then you have to take into account the impedance of the direct connected transistor M1 also. And what is the impedance of a direct connected transistor? One over GM, right? So it's far from being a good current source. Okay. So somehow magically, even if you can ensure that both currents are I naught, you will have a problem. And the bigger problem is since the impedance looking down is low, if the VDS changes, the current will change even for high, even further. Right, so it's it's not a good current source by any stretch of imagination, right? Yes. After connection through after this green line. Okay, so this is not a point. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. So if we are not using the uh, new change of target. Ah, if you neglect channel length modulation, then the current through the transistor is independent of the swing across VDS, right? Which means it's only dependent on VGS. If you keep VGS same, current will not change. Then you tell me. It's after you are considering this, this, this becomes your new equation, right? Governing equation. Okay, so through okay, so what you are essentially saying is that I have taken RDS out, and that's why it looks like current through M2 will be something, right? But this RDS is a, is a part of M2, right? So I have just shown it as a uh, as a different piece, right? So actually, the 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 full this current voltage equation is true for the current that is flowing into the transistor. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Right. Exactly. Right. So, so when you didn't use to consider RDS, your current would have been only this. Right. Independent of RDS, the extra stuff is because of RDS. Right. The extra stuff that I mean, the way uh, the reason I have taken RDS out is to basically model the transistor as an ideal transistor with a non-ideality in parallel. Right. So for this M2, you can assume that this M, the way I have sketched it, M2 doesn't have a dependence on RDS, but the dependence of RDS I have taken out and plugged it in separately. But this entire this entire thing is a, is a transistor, right? Okay, so let's target the second issue first, then you will see how the first issue evolves naturally. So the, the issue now is I have to uh, somehow manufacture a current source whose I naught doesn't really change too much with VDS, right? So what is the first thing that you can think of? How can I change M2 in order to ensure that uh, I naught doesn't change too much with VDS? 
very basic stuff of increasing RDS. Given that you know how lambda varies, right? Dependence of lambda on the transistor parameters, dependence on TDS on transistor parameters. Lambda should decrease. And if for the same current, if you want to decrease lambda, what will you do? Right, which means delta is not in your control, but L is, right? You have to increase L, right? So the first thing you can do is increase L, but only increasing L will not suffice because then current will change. You have to increase W proportionately also. So you can increase both W and L in the same proportion, and you can, which means that your RDS will increase or GDS will decrease, which means it becomes a better current source, right? It becomes a better current source, uh, or in this case, a current sink, which means I not will not vary as much with VDS. So that game I can play, but let's say, uh, I mean, I have made the transistor so big, I cannot make it bigger any further. What is the other thing that we can do? Especially folks who attended yesterday's class, can you think of something that I can do? So what is the output impedance of this configuration? Yeah, RDS of both transistor times the gain of M2 times RDS of the bottom transistor. Yeah, right? So essentially this, if I only concentrate on, Two, and I connect another M3 here and assume that things are in saturation, right? This. And we have connected something here. So the input impedance here is equal to RDS2 plus RDS3 plus the gain of intrinsic gain of M3 that is GM3 times RDS3 times RDS2. And this effectively is a dominant term if, if uh, the transistor is in saturation, which means that if let's assume GM3 times RDS2 to be much more greater than one, 10, something like that, 10, 20 or something. So which essentially means that by simply putting an M3 on top, I am effectively mimicking a transistor having uh, RDS, which is 10 times that of the bottom transistor, right? So if, let's say if GM3 times RDS3 is approximately equal to 10, this you have to ensure by design, then an RDS2 and RDS3 are of similar order, then R out is approximately equal to 10, uh, 12, right? 12 times RDS2. So in order to achieve 12 times RDS2 by simply increasing the W by, uh, simply increasing the L of M2, you would have had to increase the L by a factor of 12. You would have had to increase the W also by a factor of 12, right? So what are the transistor side would have gone up by a factor of 144, right? More than 100. But in this case, you probably with a similar sizing of M2 and M3, you would be able to, uh, you'd, you'd be able to uh, realize a transistor, effective transistor, whose output impedance is 12 times RDS. Okay. So this is something uh, that you can do, which means that this is one way of making a better current source. Right. So now looking from the top, looking from the top, the R out will be 12 times better, 12 times higher. So that's good. Any questions? No, so the question is the other way around. If there is a VTS variation, will increasing R out help? Uh, 
Exactly, right? So if the why are you doing all these things? We are doing all these things because at the core of at the heart of our issue, I I have a current source, and I if I change this voltage, I know this is not supposed to change. Correct. But if we realize this current source using a MOSFET, if I change this voltage, this I naught is going to change. Correct. And that change is proportional to the output impedance of, of the transistor. And that is RDS. And I, I cannot increase RDS by simply increasing the size of the transistor. I have to do something. So what we are doing, we are replacing this with a cascode transistor in between. And we are saying this input impedance is if this is R out one, this is R out two. So R out two is much greater than R out one. Exactly. If R out is infinity, then there is no current, no change. Exactly. Right? Okay, fine. So, so this is, uh, uh, so any questions? Yes. Yeah, tell me. There is always some effect of something when you change, right? What will it, good question. So, what will it affect? Given that you know, you have all the building blocks now, there is nothing new to learn. It's basically, it will use whatever you have to build new things, no new concepts. BDS will be body source or yeah, body source will come into effect, but let's say that that is not too much of an issue. In fact, body source will make it better, right? In, I mean, in case of you just have GM3 plus G, G, so that becomes a better garden source. So in terms of, in terms of swing limits, So when you have this some network here, when you have when you have some network, you would expect this voltage to go as low as possible, given that you have an ideal current source, right? If you have an ideal current source, you are not particularly bothered about what is the voltage across the current source is. It's an ideal current source. It will give constant current regardless of what the voltage is. Now, if you have a non-ideal current source, you have to maintain some voltage across it. In case of a transistor, you have to maintain that the transistor is in saturation. So that voltage that you have to maintain eats away the headroom of the circuit on the top because everything is biased with some VDD, right? So there is a VDD. Ideally, whatever network that you are trying to implement should have the entire headroom from VDD to ground, right? You would want, if VDD is three volt, you would want the entire network to have a headroom between v three, of three volt to ground. But because you don't have an ideal current source, you have to leave some swing, <laughs> some voltage uh, for that transistor to be in saturation. In case of a single transistor, this voltage needed to be how much? At least how much to keep it in saturation? V overdrive. So you had to keep this V overdrive in order to ensure that this M2 behaves like a current source. But this V overdrive, you are taking away from the swing. You have finite, you have finite VDD. You are taking away from the VDD. Now, if you stack two transistors, what's going to happen? What is the minimum uh, over? What is the minimum V out? Or if I call this, let's say. V tail or Vx, let's say. What is the minimum Vx? So, what is the minimum voltage at this node while keeping M2 in saturation? V overdrive of M2. What will be minimum Vx? Right? Yeah. So, v, basically, it will be this minimum will be. V overdrive of two plus V overdrive of three, right? So you are eating away a bit more of headroom, right? So this is always a problem. Okay, so that's the second part of, of the discussion today.
Okay, so now the problem is even further, uh, even bigger because now So as it turns out in design, there is no free lunch. You just have to understand which one is your most important parameter and which one you can trade off and then take a choice, right? Yes. Okay, so are you are you okay with this idea that the minimum voltage here will be P overdrive too? That the, not will be it. I mean, uh, if you can ensure that minimum voltage at that node is P overdrive too, then M2 will be in saturation. So now the question is, what, will, what is the minimum voltage of the drain of M3 to keep M3 in saturation? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, so what is R out to? R out to is this term, right? And what is R out one? R out one is only RDS two, right? So does that make sense then? Yes, right? So, or what is this term of GM three times RDS three? This is the intrinsic gain of the transistor, right? And even though my transistor is not a very good current source, it's, it's not so bad also that GM three times RDS three will be less than one. Right, so it's it will definitely be greater than one. How greater is a is a matter of I mean how you will bias it, what is the technology you know, and so on, right? So, but it will definitely be more than one. If it's less than one, you cannot design. Simply, you cannot design. So, <laughs> taking that assumption, then uh, we can make the statement that our output can be better. And let's assume that it is not very much better than one. Then what you can do, you can increase the size of M3, M2 a bit more. Right, so that you can, and if, in, if that, that doesn't suffice, you can stack another transistor on top. Right, if you stack another transistor on top, uh, your uh, your uh, output impedance will go out, go up by a factor of the gain of that transistor that you are stacking on top. Right, so you can keep on doing that, but with that, but you have to be aware that every time you stack a transistor, you are eating away head. Okay. Okay, so eating away head room is not the only problem. The problem is this. I mean, there is another problem. The problem is this. So let's not bother about what is connected at the top because we are trying to make a current mirror. Let's assume there is some voltage. Uh, it's a V naught for the time. I don't know what is or Vx. So we bias this with BB3. So now, in order to ensure that if you have I naught here, you want to have I naught here, I need to ensure that the drain of M1 and the drain of M2 are also of same value, twice and twice. Correct. So, if what is the drain of M1 at? How will you find out what is the drain voltage of M1? Correct. Right. So you can. So so basically, you can say that drain of A1 is. I mean, is that the, the gate to source voltage of M1 is the same as the drain to source voltage of M1. So we can go back and write this equation now. And now this is my full blown equation, right? But can you comment on whether uh, if I put VGS and VDS, it, it becomes a third order equation, obviously, right? So that becomes a nightmare to, uh, to, to handle. So given that we are in the process of simplification, can you comment that if I, if I neglect this term in order to figure out what the value of VGS will be, will I make a significant error? Yes. For M1, M1. 
yeah, I can write, I can make this VGS, right? So, but it eventually becomes a third order equation, right? I can solve the third order equation, right? That's not a problem, but uh, we don't want to get so deep into the details that the, the intuition gets lost. So the question is, can I neglect lambda VGS while trying to figure out the value of VGS? Yeah, so that is the way to go out. First you neglect and find out the value, then you do third order equation and find out the value and then see whether they are close enough or not. I can definitely do that, but even before doing that, can you, what is your best guess? Can I neglect or can I not? Why? Right. Ah, okay, so he, uh, if I understand correctly, his point is, the dependence of current on VGS is much stronger than the dependence of current on VDS, right? So if I have to figure out the value of VGS, then I can as well say that the weaker dependence, I will let it go and try to figure out what is what is the value of VGS, right? So while trying to figure out I know you can neglect the value of, well, sorry, while trying to figure out the value of VGS, you can neglect channel and modulation, right? And then see what, whatever, it, uh, whatever you, uh, whatever value you get, right? whatever expression you get. Granted that expression will be, will, be pro will be slightly erroneous, but it will be still in a very good approximation, yes. Yeah, that's what I said, or did I say the other way around? The gate to source voltage dependence is stronger than drain to source voltage, right? So in order to figure out the gate to source voltage, for a certain value of current, I can neglect the effect of the drain to source voltage, right? Yeah, maybe D and G sound similar. <coughs> okay, fine. So if if I can neglect, so this is the, yeah, but in case of M1, VDS and VDS VGS are same. Right? This is a diode connected device. Right? So neglect CLM for finding VGS, right? So this you can follow for all transistors uh, that you will you are going to solve. So if this is the case, what is this VGS? This, this VGS is ETH plus V overdrive of one. Okay. So <coughs> if this is this VGS, and uh, let's, Let's call this VGS for current I naught. And I, for exact mirroring, I want this voltage to be also VGS for current I naught, right? This is we want. For accurate mirroring. Do you agree with this? Yes or no? This is fine. So if we want uh, this to be a VGS, what is the handle that I have in order to ensure that this is at this value of VGS? Yes. Right, right. So in order, whenever you are trying to figure out VGS, neglect channel in all this. Okay, so now the next question is, so if I just take, if, if you're not comfortable with this terminology, let me take some numbers, right? So let's say I naught is the same, same number that we have been taking throughout the course. One milliamp, threshold voltage of one volt, W by L, of 10 mu and C ox of 0.2. So which means this becomes also one volt. So I have two volt here. I want two volt here. So what can I do? What is the design variable now? To ensure that there is a certain voltage at the, uh, uh, at the drain of M2. How can I influence that voltage at M2? Drain of M2. Hmm. 
break down the circuit, right? So we are only now concentrating on this part. We're only concentrating on this part. And you can assume that M2 is an ideal current source. Right? We are neglecting channel and modulation in order to figure out these voltages. So you can assume that M2 is an ideal current source. So I want certain voltage, two volt at the drain of M2. Uh, which transistor sets that voltage? M3, right? The VGS of M3 will set that voltage if M3 is in saturation, right? So, so now what will I? Uh, so what? So what is the design variable now? In order to ensure that we have two volt at the uh, drain of M2, VB3, right? So I have to ensure that VB3 has a voltage of two volt plus. VGS for a current of I naught, which is again two volt. Correct. So I have to ensure that this becomes four volt. If I ensure that becomes four volt, then I can ensure that the drain of M two is approximately at two volt, and the current will mirror accurately. Okay. This is again assuming all the transistors have same W by L. Right. If the W by L changes, then obviously the overdrive voltage will change. These values will change, but the principles remain the same. So, in other words, if I have to express this, if this is VB3, I want VB3 to be VGS of I naught plus another VGS of I naught, right? Because this has to be VGS of I naught, and this has to be another VGS of I naught on top of that. So this has to be two VGS for, for a current of I naught. So this is equal to Okay. So you have done this type of analysis, not in the current mirror business, but for biasing transistors accurately, right? Okay. So now the question is, how do I get this two VGS of I naught? You might say that I can just take a voltage source and plug it in there of for value of two VGS, right? But that is not a particularly good thing to do because uh, these overdrive voltages change. They are dependent on mu and C ox and all, right? So they can change with temperature. Mu and can change with temperature, which means the value of VGS can change with temperature. So if you put a fixed voltage source, which doesn't change with temperature, then you can land up in problem. So I have to extract this, I have to generate this voltage of VGS somehow without plugging in a constant voltage source. Okay. So, so now the question boils down to how do I generate two VGS? To answer that, uh, can you tell me how do I generate a single VGS? How do I generate VGS for a current of I naught? Yeah, right. So this voltage itself is VGS of I naught. You push in current into the drain of the transistor, you use negative feedback and ask the transistor to generate the appropriate voltage to sink in that current. Right? This voltage itself is VGS of I naught. And then we are using that VGS of I naught to bias M2. Now I have to generate two VGS of I naught, right? To do bias. I have one VGS of I naught. I want to generate two VGS of I naught. What should I do? I should. You can change W by L, but change, but note that your VGS has a term of threshold voltage also. So you have two threshold voltages plus two overdrives. Moment you have two threshold voltages, it should indicate that you need two transistors. Right, you need two transistors. So you, with one transistor, you are able to generate one VGS. You need two transistors to generate two VGS. How will you generate? What will be the configuration? So let me uh, ask you this. This is VGS, fine. Let's say I add a voltage source here of value V1. What will this voltage be? 
V1 plus VGS. Fine. So with this hint, can you tell me how will you generate two VGS? Yeah, right. So if, if V1 is equal to VGS for this current of Y0, I should be able to get two VGS. Right. And how do I get this VGS of Y0? Yeah, right. So this VGS of Y0 is basically a transistor, direct connected transistor, which gets a current of Y0. Right. So I have this current of Y0. All I have to do is replace that V1 with a direct connected transistor, which, uh, which has a uh, current I know, right? So, right? And this was anyways going here. And now this will go here. Okay. So, so this becomes your, your, uh, your, a more accurate cascode current mirror, right? So this structure also has uh, some issues. I will uh, I will post an assignment where you will be I'll post an assignment where you will be uh, looking. You'll be getting to know few more configurations of current mirrors, and you will see. I mean, they all have some uh, some idiosyncrasies, and when you analyze them, you'll be able to uh, get more intuition. Okay, okay.